And most people in Northern Ireland are quite content with the fact that the United Kingdom will continue to exist with Northern Ireland in it, uh, insofar as the people in Northern Ireland decide to stay. So I think it's a bit of a, a red herring in a, in a way for the rump of the DUP to be insisting on something which is inevitable anyway, and quite obvious. I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And we're, today we're going to be discussing the impact of the Windsor arrangement and Brexit more generally on Northern Ireland. Uh, our guest today is Jeff Martin, a former representative of the Commission, the European Commission, both in Belfast and in London, and also a former member of the Office of the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Jeff, welcome. Thank you for joining us. One of the reasons why the government signed up to the, the Windsor arrangement and in the form that it did uh, was the hope that the DUP could be won over for um, getting um, Stormont started again. It, it didn't work out that way. Uh, was the government naive, over-optimistic in its belief that it could win over the DUP? No, not neither naive or over-optimistic. I think the Windsor uh, framework uh, had the effect of uh, removing from the internal debate in the United Kingdom, the European Union. I mean, the president of the European Commission was very clear, as was the commissioner, that there would be no more negotiations about the uh, about the arrangements to do with the UK and uh, and the European Union. And it left the UK facing, as you correctly point out, some problems from the DUP. Uh, the DUP is a strange animal, as we very well know, and of course, the, they always have to say no and continue to do so. However, on the bright side for a change, I feel that the the Windsor arrangements, which as well as dealing with details about free trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, also provided for the beginnings of an important international trade relationship uh, within these islands. And indeed, in September of this year, there's going to be a very big trade conference in Northern Ireland, after which, or maybe even before which, I'm reliably told the DUP will use in order to lever itself into the executive for the first time. That's good news. That's very, very good news if it if it works out that way. Can, can we examine a bit more what have been the objections of the DUP up till now? Um, well, are they genuine? Could, can their, their concerns ever be met? No, they're they're never genuine. They they are fundamental sovereign maniacs, and of course, <laughs> in being so, they ally themselves with the sovereign uh, people in the right wing of the Conservative Party. And uh, as we have seen, nothing that the UK government has done vis-a-vis -vis Brexit or the European Union and Northern Ireland has ever satisfied the DUP. So I think the government here got completely fed up and decided to move ahead. And as I hope we will see, in moving ahead, they have put the DUP into a position of either joining a, a respectable international trade conference or not joining it at all, and therefore avoiding presence in the, D, in the, in the Northern Ireland executive forever. The U, DUP was always predicted to crawl, having lost many of his battles, back into the, into the executive committee. And I think it will do so now on the back end of this conference. Also, in next month, there's going to be um, legislation apparently adopted at Westminster, which will give further reassurance to the DUP that um, the United that, that that it will not that Northern Ireland won't leave the U United Kingdom, other than in very tightly defined um, um, circumstances. Um, do you think that will serve to reassure them as well? well maybe it may, may it may reassure a small minority of DUP hardliners, but but uh, most people in Northern Ireland are quite content with the fact that the United Kingdom will continue to exist with Northern Ireland in it, uh, insofar as the people in Northern Ireland decide to stay. So I think it's a bit of a, a red herring in a, in a way for the rump of the DUP to be insisting on something which is inevitable anyway, and quite obvious. Yeah. Have, have there been personnel and personal clashes within the DUP, particularly between people in London, people based in London and people based in Belfast over the past few months? Yes, I think there, there are some divisions, if not splits, then differences of, of a view between the DUP in Northern Ireland and the, particularly the office holders who are largely in Westminster, based on the fact that the DUP members want their people to get back into the Assembly in Northern Ireland 
apart from which they'll start earning their salaries again, whereas the DUP in Westminster are the hierarchy of the party and have tended to go along with the sovereign, the sovereignty purists, which lodges, which lodges itself uh, principally in Westminster and nowhere else that I can think of. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit more about how you think the next few months will, will pan out? Um, do you think Stormwell will be set up before this conference that you're talking about, or will it only be after that? Well, that's unclear. I read the other day that the the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service has invited all the participating parties in a potential executive to meet together soon. Now that the Secretary of State, Heaton Harris, has decided to slightly stop back, step back from his involvement in Northern Ireland affairs in order for the head of the civil service to bang heads together and to suggest that it would be in the interests of each of the parties in Northern Ireland, including the DUP, to get back or need to prepare to get back into the assembly before the December conference actually takes place. That, I think, would be a sensible thing. I mean, the other side of that coin, by the way, is that Heaton Harris, as the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, has had to bear the burden of of deciding things which he doesn't really want to decide upon as a Winston, as a Westminster cabinet minister. And he runs the risk, or the risk is run. If this is if this process continues much longer, uh, for of allegations of a de facto direct rule arrangement creeping into the system, and nobody wants that, including the Republic of Ireland. You, I think it was a slip of the tongue at the um, the investment conference, as I understand it, it is in September, not yes, in December. December. It's September. Sorry, December. Sorry, sorry. And um, and I, as I understand it, there are also urgent budgetary questions which need to be resolved, um, which it's very difficult to resolve without um, Stormont being back up and running. Indeed, they're very important ones, particularly in the area of health, where the where the input from local representatives is vitally important. Yes. Yes. Um, more generally, uh, can, can we talk about the question of Brexit and its implications for Irish unification? Uh, there are people, and this this has been, I think, at the back of a lot of the concerns from the DUP, who think that um, uh, the Westminster, the w Windsor framework, the um, the general um, agreement between North, between the United Kingdom and the um, uh, the European Union in order to implement Brexit puts the position of Northern Ireland in question. And there are people who think that Brexit makes Irish unification much more likely, much more proximate. Um, what's your view on that? Well, my view is that, uh, first of all, let's face the fact that for the first time in 110, in two, 102 years, the Northern Ireland uh, electorate have acted in such a way as to make a Sinn Féin member the first minister in a new power-sharing executive. That is new, and that puts a lot of fear into the minds of some rather narrow-minded unionists. On the other hand, uh, the Brexit arrangements have provided for Northern Ireland, in terms of, of goods at least, to become part of the European single market, which offers huge potential opportunities. Unfortunately, however, very few people in Northern Ireland are talking about that, and even fewer actually understand what it means. So I think that as we move into the next couple of months ahead, whereas the attention might be focused on trade from America, for example, as well as from other parts of Europe, trade the focus will also become, um, I hope, focused on the potential benefits of an all-Ireland uh, free trade arrangement, albeit with Northern Ireland remember, uh, remaining part of the United Kingdom. That having been said, there is no doubt about the fact that from an, uh, from an outsider's point of view, Brexit does suggest that a unity arrangement for Northern Ireland is nearer at hand than ever before. Well, I take a pinch of that with a pinch of salt. It's possibly correct. On the other hand, public opinion in the south of Ireland, yes, uh, would love unity to take place. But from the point of Northern Ireland, I can't, I can't see why many unionists, be they DUP or official unionists, would want to have a united Ireland tomorrow morning, or at least not even in the, in the near future, or indeed ever. Because there is a group of people in Northern Ireland 
who will never consent, in my view, or agree to some form of unity. There may be have to be some form of halfway house. For example, as I think it might be the case, if when the executive gets up and running again, apparently it will do so, you know, with a changed DUP uh, arrangement, with with Donaldson with Donaldson staying in Westminster, the the assembly may well function quite well, but there will come a time sooner rather than later, I think, when there'll be problems which will be uh, unrealizable or unresolvable by the two major elements in the Northern Ireland Assembly, and then they will have to revert. Uh, reluctantly, to intervention in parallel from the British Council, from the British government and from the government in the Republic, and don't let's forget, in doing in in saying that, Brendan, that all of that is surrounded by the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement, which makes the relationships between Northern and Southern Ireland closer than ever before. It provides, amongst other things, for example for the existence of a north-south ministerial meeting, one of the so-called three strands, the other ones being the executive of the north and the east-west relationship between the United between the rest of the United Kingdom and Ireland. So if you put all of these things into a mix, yes, people have a right to believe that the unification of Ireland is coming along rather nicely or better than before, but I don't think it's likely in the in the, in the near future, if ever. So you don't foresee a referendum in, in say, the next 10 years? Well, uh, that's a different point. I mean, I do see a referendum in the next 10 years. But, of course, a referendum will be an advisory exercise. And the polls which I've been looking at for the, for the last year have conclusively proven, all of them together, taken together, that the majority of people in Northern Ireland will not would not like to vote yes in a referendum on Irish unity. Uh, the, the, the margins in some cases are as much as 60% against and 30% in favour, or 50% in favour and 30 so for 31% against. So these things, which appear to be logical and sensible for, for outside audiences, audiences in the United States of America or Europe or indeed England, uh, fall into a different perspective when looked at from a Northern Ireland, from a Northern Ireland perspective. Can you foresee any um, creative thinking of, um, of, say, shared sovereignty or um, a particular relationship between the, the Northern Ireland um, and the rest of the United Kingdom? Yes. Um, do you think there are options there that need to be explored? Yes. If you if we set aside. Uh, old style, what I would call old style unity, in other words, a totally united island of 32 counties with no relationships with Britain, which won't work in my view. I can envisage, and Sinn Féin in the north has sought this position in recognizing the fact that in any uh, unification arrangement, there should be room for people in the north to satisfy their needs to be regarded as British. How that would fit in, in terms of constitutional niceties, I don't know. But it is a possibility that in the middle of these negotiations, there could be an arrangement by which Northern Ireland would effectively be a form of united geographical area, supported independently, but in parallel, both by the Republic and the United Kingdom. I can see that happening. Because many people, both Catholic and Protestant in Northern Ireland, prefer to live in the context in which they currently exist, even though it's politically uh, unstable, because the threats towards Catholics and discrimination against them have been largely removed. Uh, human rights have been looked after extremely carefully by the Police Federation of Northern Ireland and so on. So you, you see in Northern Ireland a very different place to the one which existed in the years of the Troubles, definitely. Good. Well, finally, would you like to summarise in a few sentences what you think the, the overall impact of Brexit has been on, on Northern Ireland? I think in general terms, Brexit has been a disappointment because it's, it's, it's created the difficulties which we now are moving through. On the other hand, there is a large body of opinion in both parts of the community in Northern Ireland who do not 
attend to the niceties of current affairs, and they're completely unaware of the fact, for example, that prosperity in the South has grown hugely, uh, and that in England, there are difficulties which we are currently encompassing with inflation and so on. They don't see the the UK or Ireland in that way. They see the UK and Ireland in a 30-time uh, spectacle, turn by them, uh, a view 30 years out of date. On the other hand, or in closing, on a possible, in a, in a in a, in a positive or positive note, there is no doubt about the fact that the business community in Northern Ireland begins to see the potential advantages of the single market uh, following Brexit, the single market effect. And although many of them are used to deal with exclusively with, with uh, English companies and not companies either in Northern Ireland or the, or, or, or the rest of the European Union, the power of the pound sterling or the euro, depending on how you look at it, will win in the end, and we will see a gradually we will see a gradual improvement in these wider relationships, and therefore, hopefully, in the prosperity of Northern Ireland as a small part of both Ireland and the United Kingdom, as it currently is. Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. Um, I'm sure we'll dis be discussing this again, and um, there'll be much more for viewers of the Federal Trust YouTube channel um, to enjoy. Thank you and goodbye. Okay, bye.